army of Macedonia, uh, Mesopotamia, excuse me, is going to march down the Tigris River to Siebestaban, the Persian capital, while the main pre presidential, i.e. in the presence of army, not presidential like the president, this army is in the presence of the emperor, which is the imperial army, the big one, 60,000 men are going to march down the Euphrates and hit Siebestaban from the west. So they're going to get him in a pincer. This army up here is Armenians and Romans. That's the plan. Shapur has got about 40,000 men in his royal army massed. So he's on the horns of dilemma. Who does he oppose? The force coming down here or the force coming across here? The other thing that Julian planned, which again, the campaign planning was brilliant. I mean, it was brilliant. He is on par with Caesar and everybody else in the campaign planning. The, the intent was this is all going to take place before June. Why is June important? This is the Zagros Mountains. The ice in the passes doesn't melt until before June. And the majority of the Persians are on the other side of the passes. So he's planning to step off in March, march down the Euphrates, besiege Siestaphon, and take the city before the Persian army can mass. Great plan. When you read it, it's a great plan. When you look at it, it's a great plan. There was a problem in execution. The first thing is, remember I told you that Julian the Apostate was trying to push Christianity back into uh, as a minor player. Armenians were Christians. And he made the mistake of alienating the Armenian leadership. Depending on which story you believe, and I believe one of them by a very inaccurate historian is, when, the, when Julian's army of 60,000 stepped off to march down the, the uh, Euphrates, there were 7,000 Armenian cavalrymen with Sebastian and Procopius in the army of Mesopotamia, and probably more coming down out of the mountains. Unfortunately, a senior church official in Armenia, with the king trying to impress Julian, was martyred. So guess what happened? Those 7,000 cavalrymen decamped and went back to Armenia. Now, why don't we have, why do I say I'm coming from a very minor historian to tell you this? Because we have a hole in Arminius Marcellanus' account at this particular time. At that particular time. We know they're supposed to come down here because there's another comment 60 days later and we know that there were two generals there, one who was sitting around uh, enjoying his station and one who was fighting. And when you know the people, the fighter was Sebastian and the guy sitting around was Procopius. But what happens is that army of 30 to 40,000 is only now, oops, 20 to 30,000 Romans. And I put 20 to 30,000 because it depends on which source you're using. I use 20 normally. So 20,000 against 40,000 is what? Oh, Automatic loss for the Romans. So all that they can do is defend Mesopotamia against King Shapur if he decides to do a counterattack as Julian's coming south. So now let's talk about Julian heading south. <clears throat> Very similar as we saw before. Julian had 60,000 men as he marched down. Now, you'll see if you read about it, the people don't agree with me. There's 20,000 soldiers working the 1,000 ships in the Euphrates River. We know that because I mean, March says there's 20,000 there. So there's 40,000 in this group here. Infantry, cavalry. <coughs> He's marching in basically three columns a security column along the, uh, the river, and then two main body columns. So you're talking about 40,000 soldiers, 10,000 which are cavalry, so you only got 30,000 infantry there, 
and Julian wants to make sure that the Persians think there's more of him, so he makes his column 10 miles long. Remember, we talked about 50,000 men take up 10 miles. He's making 30,000 infantry look like it's 50,000. Now, did you notice this is a security screen? Okay, the Saran, which is the second most person, person in Persia, is in command of this delaying action. He's got about 5,000 Persian border troops and arrows. And he's fighting a series of skirmishes as Julian comes down the river. And he's winning them. Now, the army's marching south. The security screen is getting its nose punched in every day. But it's not affecting the army's advance at this point. Julian gets down to uh, besiege uh, Prince Sephora. It's a great description if you read it. Uh, is basically taken by a bunch of brave legionnaires who tunnel under the wall and at sunup when the garrison is praising the sun and the, because they're, or they're uh, Zoroastrians and the king, they break into the city and take it uh, at the last second and uh, it's very interesting. After taking there, they go down a canal and they start the battle, the key battle of the entire campaign. The Persian army hasn't shown up yet. All we're fighting now is the Sharan, 5,000 Arab cavalrymen, and the garrison, the Siestapon. So we're coming up about 15,000 men on the Persian side against 60,000 on the, on the uh, Roman side. But the Persian cavalry, the first thing they do when the Romans set up their first camp is they cross the river and they raid his supply line because they had to take the animals out of the fort to graze, and of course the Persian cavalry goes there and whacks them. Another skirmish, they move up to a second uh, camp. This is one of the, one of the most interesting fights in the, of late antiquity, is Julian, a pagan, starts having games on, day, on the day. That night he has 800 men cross the river at night to try and storm the city the next day. 800. Puts them on barges, they cross. The exilia from the, from, from the Rhine don't want to be left out because they want heavily armored men, so they're legionnaires. They swim the Tigris to be part of the fight. The Persians aren't surprised, they're waiting for them. There's a night fight, and Victor, who is the commander on the Seine, gains the high ground and he's now looking across the plain as the sun comes up with less than 10,000 men because the boats are going back and forth and he's looking at 15,000 cavalry and elephants and infantry and he's probably really 5,000 to 10,000, he's out, heavily outnumbered so what's he do, anybody? He attacks or retreats. Well yeah, so what did Victor do? He's a Roman. Of course, he charges, <laughs> right when the Persians are praising the sun and catches them in a prayer. A big fight takes place. Julian crosses with a hand and full of bodyguards. Who's controlling the battle? Oh, wow. Oh. Hey, Julian. Uh, Julian yeah, the Julian is, should have been controlling the battle, but, but he Victor wasn't. Doesn't give up command. Julian is really big into Homer and being a hero, oh. and so he's running around fighting when the line is getting weak here and here. As you said, when you go to individual combat, you've lost it. And that's what's happening here. Exactly. This place is an individual combat. Victor is with the, an assault force that tries to, they break the Persians. Victor is in pursuit to the, one of the gates of Siestapon. He gets nailed from the wall. And he loses heart, or probably got knocked out. He stops the assault. He's afraid if his 500 guys with him make it through the gate, they'll get massacred when they get into this mega city. The worst call of the battle. But you can't pick on Victor because he's probably not, he's got a concussion, he's, been, he's, he's wounded. Uh, he's, he's down to 500 guys. Yeah, and he's got 500 guys because the battle's still going on over here. Yeah. Who's responsible? Julian. He didn't take control of the battle and take that 500 guys he's running around with as a res 
prepared to take the game. He wanted to play Achilles. He wanted to play Achilles, and uh, at this point, he blows it. This is the only chance he's going to get because now it's June. The passes have melted. The Persians from the other side of the Zagros are coming in. And now this is where the myth of he was, you know, led astray by guides, and he wasn't led astray by guides. He realizes with the Persian army that his scouts have seen, he can't besiege the city. Three other Roman emperors in the 300s took this city. He's got a full field army out there, and he's got to deal with it. So he doesn't take the city. He's famous for burning his boats, which was his supplies, but he had no supplies in them. He just, if you actually do the computation, those boats are empty. So he keeps 12 boats, puts them on ox wagons for pontoons. Okay? He, you know, he's not a second-rate general. He's, he's pretty up there. So he forms a square and he starts marching north. He realizes he's out of supply, he's got to get back to Roman territory. He's botched the campaign, he couldn't take the city, so he starts marching north. He's got a significant problem is his cavalry has been blinded and outclassed by the Persian cavalry. So he now has really no security screen. So he's literally marching in a square that's four miles long probably two miles across. All of his baggages are in this inside. And if you're the Persian commander, what are you going to do? Break the square, it's way from thin. Well, how do you break it? Well, if you're the Persian commander and you've got a lot of archers and horse cavalry, you're just gonna... Well, no, in theory, if you believe most, what you're gonna do though is hit him in the back. Why? Because you're marching in the opposite direction. Because you're automatically going to form a gap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This happens day after day. Oh, God. Okay. And so what happens is Julian, with the heavy cavalry, has to ride two miles back, fight the breach, re reform the square. While everything is continuing to move. Right. Where well, everything's all in motion. So this happens for a couple days. On the day he gets killed... The Persians are sitting here watching him do this. Because, you know, he rides with a bunch of banners and everything. Everybody yeah, knows the emperor's there, this. and the best soldiers are there with the plumes and everything else. So on the day they kill him, they start off with an attack in the rear. Julian's riding up towards the front with his bodyguard and heavy cavalry. The rear guard has to stop. They continue to march up. Julian takes the heavy cavalry, rides like hell to the back. Now it's 120 degrees that I mentioned that. <laughs> Julian doesn't have his armor on. The rest of his soldiers do, but he doesn't have his armor. It's 120 degrees. Okay, how do I know that? Because I had my cousins and friends serve in this particular area in the summer, in June. He comes back, stabilizes it, and guess what happens next? He can tell you, you, number two. The Persians hit him in the front. Cause you more So he rides back up. And then the real attack actually hits. These are all diversions. An elephant cavalry attack. Hammers the riverside part of the, and it collapses. Okay, so Julian then rides into and try to rally that. That's where he gets killed. And after that, with the leader dead, what's it become? No. It would be a mob if the Roman army wasn't good. Okay. This is one of the things that shows you they were good, and all the myths about the late Roman army being weak or not. The centurions fix it. And the counts and the dukes fight like centurions with their own little bodyguard. The elephants are trampling on everything. They eventually rally their troops and reestablish the left wing and push it back out. But Julian's dead. A traitor in the Jovian religion, uh, region, uh, excuse me, Jovius is elected. One of Jovius's enemies, who is the stand bearer of the Jovian legion, <laughs> deserts because he's going to get killed by the new emperor. So he goes over to Shapur and he goes, uh, Julian's dead, and we're in a heap of trouble over there. 
So now we're going to talk about the Battle of the Elephants. So at this particular time, camps were made because there was no wood or anything else. They put their um, wagons in a, in a wagon lager. That made the wall, the, you know, the traditional Roman camp. Still setting up pretty much like a traditional Roman camp. But the wagons are the walls. Type thing. So the legions go in. The next day, the security screen goes out. Two legion, the legions start coming out to form their square, and they're ambushed by elephants. Think about that. You're ambushed by elephants. There's no security at all. That was defeated a long time ago. And the other thing I, I failed to mention is when one of those little skirmishes that is, is so minor that it's barely mentioned by Manus Marcellinus, the ox carts couldn't keep up with the square because they're being abused. And the pontoon boats were on. So they're trapped on the eastern side of the Tigris. And the Battle of the Elephants is really interesting because the screen came out, the first two legions came out. Luckily, they were elite. Uh, and it should be, yeah, the Jovian and the Herculean, very elite legions, best in the entire Roman army for the next hundred years. They come out, and as everybody's running away, because the elephants are charging across the steps with the cavalry in support, they form, they get beaten back to the wagons, use the wagons as a barricade, make a stand. What you see there, probably the confusion it looked like. And two more elite legions march out of the camp and hit the elephants in the flank, kill two, and the Persians pull off. Yeah. How many elephants are you talking about? 13. We're not talking one or two, we're talking 13. So they kill two, Persians pull back. Why did the Persians pull back? They got plenty of time, they're trapped. They know their pontoon boats aren't there. They're trapped on the east side. They didn't do, they didn't do a pause, a truce, bury your dead, all that stuff, but the Persians are being really nice. They let them do pauses all the time. They're now only making three or four miles a day. They're running out of food. They got their, uh, you know, their bread ration before they left. They got 20 days of bread ration. Every day you stand there messing around, you're more, longer and longer in the trap. Okay, 